All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, welcome and thanks for joining us today for our webinar on Medi-Cal services for children with autism spectrum disorder and the family-focused model of care. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to let you know a little bit about Family Voices of California. These presentations are statewide trainings on topics that affect children and youth with special health care needs. Our webinars are geared toward diverse groups, which include families, professionals, and parent-to-parent -parent resource staff and advocates. FVCA is a statewide coalition of locally based parent-run centers working to make sure children and youth with special health care needs receive quality care. As a state affiliate of the National Family Voices, we are California's federally funded family-to-family -family health information center, providing statewide support to families of children and youth with special health care needs. A few notes about today's technology. If you have any technical difficulties, you can call GoToWebinar directly at the number here on the screen. Also, due to our feedback issues, we have everyone on mute from our end. Throughout today's webinar, please feel free to type in questions in the question box on the right-hand side of your menu. Dr. Chow will pause midway for questions and will also save about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for any additional questions. And if you have any personal questions pertaining to your child, please go ahead and email Dr. Chow and he'll get back to you about those. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted on the Family Voices website afterwards. After the webinar, you'll be emailed a very short survey to evaluate today's presentation, and we thank you in advance for taking the time to give us your invaluable feedback. It's now my pleasure to introduce our wonderful speaker, Dr. Clayton Chow. Dr. Chow is currently the Regional Executive Medical Director for the Mental Health Network, St. Joseph Hogue Health, Providence St. Joseph Health System, Southern California, Orange County, High Desert Region, where he joined in January of 2017. Previously, he was a Senior Medical Director for Health Services at LA Care Health Plan, the nation's largest public health plan responsible for behavioral health, care management, utilization management, disease management, health integration quality improvement, behavioral health long-term care, health education and cultural linguistics, physician concurrent review, strategic initiatives, and provider continuing education. He was also the co-principal investigator for a multi-year center for Medicare and Medicaid services, innovation grant, and transforming clinical practice. He's a lecturer for the UCLA School of Public Health and an associate clinical professor of psychiatry at UC Irvine School of Medicine. Prior to joining Health Plan, he worked for the Orange County Health Care Agency Behavioral Health Services for 13 years, providing care to people living with severe persistent mental illness and integrated care for the county's public health HIV clinic. He was also the director of the Center of Excellence in Education, Training, Research, and Advocacy for Reducing Health Disparities. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over here to Dr. Chow in one second. Okay, and Dr. Chow, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation to uh, do this uh, seminar today. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad you're able to join us. And as uh, Sarah mentioned earlier, uh, if you have any question uh, specifically to your child or your own case, um, please send me an email uh, to the email address uh, on the screen right now, and I will be sure to respond to you. Um, just for the confidentiality issue. So uh, I will only respond to any general question that would be applicable to everyone. Next slide, please. So today with uh, about uh, 50 minutes or so, next slide, please, Sarah. Sarah, next slide, please. Oh, it was, okay. Is it, goes it going? Uh, no, I'm still at the uh, first slide. Oh, um, I'm showing, okay. Um, it's going through on my 
so on my screen one second sorry everyone um, okay let's start this again is it at the at the third slide yet no this is still okay. the first slide yes um one second oh there we go okay Thank there you. was a little bit of a lag sorry about yes, that yes so this is um if you go back to the uh, the second slide the previous slide okay. There we okay, go. Perfect. So in, in, in about 50 minutes, I'm going to briefly uh, talk about um, EPSDT early and periodic screening, diagnostic, and treatment, and the mental health services for Medi-Cal children. Then we're going to talk about autism spectrum disorders, the referral process, and eligibility for behavioral health treatments for ESD. And then lastly, I want to spend some time to talk to you about the um, family-focused model of care. Uh, next slide, please. So on this slide uh, uh, is the introduction to early and periodic screening, diagnostic, and treatment, and, uh, uh, other no, otherwise known as EPSDT. Uh, this is uh, based on Section 1905A4B of the Social Security Act, uh, where um, Medicaid is responsible to provide a comprehensive rate of preventive diagnostic and treatment for low-income infants, children, and adolescents under the, the age of 21. Um, and uh, really, um, uh, states are required to provide uh, these cover services that is determined to be medically necessary. And here's the important piece, medically necessary to correct or ameliorate any physical or behavioral conditions. So this benefit structure is designed to ensure that children receive, again, here's the important keyword, early detection and preventive care, uh, and then also medically necessary treatment services. But, you, but, but we ought to see this as an attempt to early identify uh, uh, children with um, a health issue and then to also provide preventive care, right? So. Um, the, the, the medical necessity uh, criteria for EPSDT is much broader than for adults over the age of 18. And, 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 and so that's where the confusion come in is, what about 18 to 21? And, and there's a lot of people still think of 18 as falling under the adult benefit, but actually the EPSDT cover all the way up to age 21. So that's the difference. And that's the confusion that most people would have. So technically, when you cross over to A21, the benefit is, is, is much less um, uh, because the definition of medical necessity is much stricter than the definition of medical necessity for EPSDT. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the, the lag here. <laughs> Sorry, there appears to be a lag because we're on slide four here. So well, just let... On slide four, this is the, uh, so when you think about um, adolescent behavior health care, we have to think about the responsibility of the health plan as well as the responsibility of the county, individual county, a Department of Behavioral Health or Department of Mental Health. So under the health plan responsibility, the EPSDT for children under 21, Again, health plans must provide a broad range of medical necessity services, that including healthcare, diagnostic services, treatment to correct and ameliorate defects, and physical and mental illnesses and conditions that are discovered by the screening services. So screening is very, very important. Um, and on top of that, in California, beginning September 2014, uh, behavioral health treatment applied behavior analysis was added to the health plan benefit, and it sits outside of the mental health benefit. So that's the key that you need to know. So the behavior health treatment ABA services for ASD is actually outside of the mental health benefit that are mentioned underneath the EPSDT. Um, whereas the therapeutic behavioral services and the specialty mental health services remain available under the, the, the local county Department of Mental Health or Department of Behavioral Health. Uh, substance use treatment, disorder treatment services are available under drug medicals, and, and you might be aware that uh, in, uh, in California, 
through the 1115 waiver, we have implemented the drug Medi-Cal organized delivery system, and certain county has started, but uh, pretty soon most county will uh, implement the a new drug, the Medi-Cal benefit, uh, which are much more inclusive uh, than the current drug Medi-Cal benefit. Next slide, please. So the next slide, uh, which is coming up, will talk about the adolescent behavior health care under the responsibility of the county Department of Mental Health. Uh, I, I will say, I will use the term county Department of Mental Health, um, uh, realizing that in most county, uh, it is the county Department of Behavioral Health because most county Department of Behavioral Health have responsibility for both the mental health and the substance use disorder benefits. So for the county, the county also are, uh, are responsible for providing or arrange for the provision of specialty mental health services uh, for all medical beneficiaries that meet the medical necessity criteria. So now um, when you call the county for services, um, the county cannot just do a quick screen over the phone and that your child will meet medical necessity or not. Actually, the, the county is obligated to provide a full assessment in order to determine whether or not your child will meet medical necessity uh, for specialty mental health services. Uh, so um, I know most county made an attempt to any call for services for children, they'll bring the child in and they do a full assessment before they determine whether or not um, the child would meet the medical necessity. And the key words here again, medical necessity for children under EPSDT is very, very loose, okay? Um, to receive specialty mental health services, basically, medical children and youth must have a covered diagnosis, that's number one, and meet the following two criteria. The condition, the mental health condition, that would not be responsive to the physical health care based on treatment. So for an example, if your child um, I'll give you an example, has a thyroid problem, and from the thyroid problem, your child gets anxiety or get depression. Um, basically, if you treat the thyroid problem, then uh, the mental health condition would go away. So those kind of conditions that are secondary to a physical health condition um, that would respond to the treatment of the physical health condition, then it would not meet the, the, the criteria for specialty mental health services, okay? Um, and then the second piece is the services are necessary to correct and ameliorate basically the same criteria as what EPSDT was talking about. And um, the services can be provided by any qualified provider operating within the scope of his or her practice as defined by the state law, regardless of whether or not that provider is a medical provider. So that's the piece that there's a leadway in terms of uh, uh, who can provide the services uh, under the purposes of the specialty mental health services. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I think the next slide um, is talking about the different services, and I've created a grid um, that would uh, tell you uh, pretty much uh, what are the different services uh, that uh, are, are available in terms of uh, mental health uh, for Medi-Cal kid. And I'm, I'm still waiting for the slide to advance. There we go. So this is very, very helpful. And I'm hoping that uh, perhaps you can uh, email uh, Sarah or Pip and get this slide. Uh, it basically talks about the responsibility um, under the primary care physician as it relates to mental health. And then it lay out the responsibility under the health plan as is related to providing mental health services, and then what is under the specialty mental health services under county department of mental health, and then what would be the responsibility for the county substance abuse administrator to provide. This very last column will change very quickly depending on uh, whether or not your local county department uh, of, uh, substance, of County Substance Abuse Administration will be implementing the drug medical uh, organized delivery system. Uh, so uh, the services will be much more than what's listed here. This is your traditional drug medical services currently. Okay, so it's very important that you uh, have a copy of this slide. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I think next slide is uh, when uh, we have a few minutes to check in, for me to check in with you. Uh, any questions so far? Hi, thanks so much. Um, we don't have any questions at this moment, but I'll let you know if any trickle in here while we take a, a little break. Great, great. So, so then good. we should just proceed then, okay? Okay, sounds good. I'll ask the question at the next check-in point. Okay. So next we're gonna talk about what is uh, autism spectrum disorder and how do I get treatment, et cetera. Um, I wanted to start by saying that the referral process uh, and and the, the 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 receiving services that I'm I'm talking about based on LA County, uh, but it pretty much uh, uh, align with the, the the state requirement for health plan. So I will explain what that means as we go uh, to the individual slide that speak to the process. But basically, what is autism? Um, uh, uh, the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, DSM-5, has reclassify and bundle all of the, the previous DSM-4-TR diagnosis into one single diagnosis. So previously, you've heard of autistic disorder, childhood disintegrative disorder, pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, and Asperger's syndrome. All those four uh, separate diagnoses uh, is now un lumped under uh, aut autism spectrum disorder uh, in the DSM-5, so it's ASD. Uh, so what it does is, is bring a lot more people uh, services that traditionally is only made available to autistic disorder children. So now you have other uh, diagnosis, um, other condition, um, but you carry the diagnosis of ASD, you will also be uh, 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 eligible for those services uh, that um, are currently available. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide talk about the prevalence of ASD, uh, autistic spectrum disorder. Uh, basically, as far as we know, one out of eight, 68 children and one in every 42 boys will be diagnosed with ASD. Um, there's a, from the year of 2002 to 2008, this is an 78% increase in the ASD diagnosis. Now, one might say probably because our screening tool and our diagnostic tool, um, tools have been much more sensitive uh, and specific, and that's why we saw an increase, um, perhaps um, uh, there's some other factor, uh, environmental factor or what have you, uh, that also causes this increase, and, and, and please notice that this increase is not just in the United States, but it's everywhere in the world. Uh, when you talk about gender differences, there's about four to one male to female ratio, and that's why uh, when you average it out, you see one in 68, but when you only count boys, it's one in every 42 boys. Um, uh, when you talk about boys compared to uh, girls, uh, they are about 8.8 times more likely to have intellectual ability within the average range. So another word, a female would average IQ uh, tend to have less symptoms of ASD than boy with a similar IQ level. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So in the next slide, we'll talk about how long does it take for people to get diagnosis. On the average, the uh, median age of diagnosis is about 44 months. Um, uh, epidemiological study suggested that there are no differences by race or ethnicity in the actual prevalence or incident of autism. But what happened is when you look at individual rate uh, of uh, when the child get diagnosed, there are significant differences uh, between different races. Uh, for an example, 30% more likely to be identified with ASD uh, in Caucasian children than Hispanic Black children, and 50% and more Caucasian children uh, are likely to be identified with ASD than Hispanic children. Uh, what it means is that the, um, the uh, awareness and the diagnostic process uh, for the other ethnic groups is much lower than in our Caucasian children. Um, that's what it meant. Uh, next slide, please. So basically, um, state require that um, there has to be a screening process in the primary care setting. Uh, then once a primary care uh, provider suspects that a child has 
uh, ASD, um, a comprehensive diagnostic evaluation must be performed. And it could be performed by regional centers or by any uh, professional group that specialize in uh, performing co comprehensive diagnostic evaluation. So as I mentioned before, in LA County, and particularly uh, LA CARE, uh, they have uh, um, uh, an agreement with the regional centers that one's a PCP, primary care physician, uh, suspect that a child has uh, autistic spectrum disorder, the child get referred to regional center for a comprehensive diagnostic evaluation to formalize the diagnosis. Now, uh, I've realized that in California, we have about 21 regional centers, and a third of them, or seven, concentrated in LA County, and there are other county where the regional centers are really impacted by the caseload, and perhaps referring to the regional center might not be um, the route. Uh, but what, what, whatever route that is, the initial assessment is very, very important, is the comprehensive diagnostic evaluation in order to give a child a diagnosis. It cannot be just primary care physician uh, or any licensed person just check in with the child for 15 minutes and then make a determination that the child has the diagnosis. I don't think that's fair to the family. I don't think that's fair to the child because there are other conditions that also mimic symptoms of ASD. And you really, without a complete comprehensive diagnostic evaluation, it would not be to the child advantage to give the child that label because treatment intervention might be very different, right? And then on top of that, if a child uh, have access to regional center, remember the other services that regional center can provide to the child and the family that are outside of the Medi-Cal benefit. And, and I think that's very, very important. And that's why I strongly believe that all children uh, when they, they should be connected to the regional center. And if the child is two, uh, is two and a half years of age or older, the caregiver uh, particularly should be referred to regional center because there's other special education uh, that the regional center can provide to the caretaker. Okay, next slide, please. So this slide really depicts uh, a, a pathway. So if you a child was referred to a regional center or an entity, uh, that can complete the comprehensive diagnostic evaluation, CDE, and we'll talk about what that entails. Uh, so there, there, there are actually three, three pathways. Um, I did not add the third one, and I'll explain what that is. So the, the, the possibility is that the CDE indicates the diagnosis of ASD and, here's the important, and behavioral health treatment or BHT and ABA is recommended by a licensed psychologist or physician after viewing, viewing the whole CDE, then the member would contact the health plan and request for behavioral health treatment. If the CDE does not indicate a diagnosis of ASD, then that will be it, right? So the child would not meet the medical, the, the, the eligibility for the BHT services under Medi-Cal. But again, that's why it's important that the child being evaluated by the regional center because the child might uh, uh, qualify for other services that the regional center has. Now, the third pathway that I didn't talk about is uh, in it, 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 there are instances when a child the, from the CDE is indicated there's a, there is a diagnosis of ASD, but the, the evaluating team, and I'm going to say team, including the licensed psychologist or physician, do not feel that the child at that moment need BHT or ABA, um, then the child would not be receiving uh, the BHT treatment. Now we've had cases where the family, the caregiver um, uh, uh, complained to the health plan and said, well, my child has ASD and I don't believe that my child doesn't need a BHT or ABA uh, and complaining to the health plan or bring it to the health plan um, uh, uh, awareness that uh, uh, you could uh, qualify for a second opinion, right? Just like any other condition. If you go see a cardiologist, the cardiologist says, yes, you have this condition, but I don't think you need this treatment. And if you disagree, you're always entitled, entitled to a second opinion. Now, if the CDE said your child doesn't have an ASD, I don't know if you want to fight and get another 
CDE done to make sure that your child has the ASD. I don't think I would in, not encourage that, although I think that you are entitled to it, but I think that the entitlement for second opinion uh, usually around whether or not your child uh, would need uh, ABA services uh, at the moment. So I hope I make that uh, clear. If, if you have any confusion on that, please send me an email. Uh, next, P, next slide, please. So next slide, talk about what is under the comprehensive diagnostic evaluation. Basically, here are the stuff that need to be done based on best practice guidelines. Um, the team has to interview the parents of the caretaker. They have to review relevant medical, psychological, and or school records. They have to do cognitive developmental assessment. Uh, there has to be a direct play observation. Uh, measurement of adaptive functioning, and a comprehensive medical examination. And that should be done by the primary care physician, uh, which is a requirement under EPSDT. Basically, uh, it, it means uh, the, the P primary care physician at the top of the family have to do an unclosed full examination on the child and also order some, some uh, lab work, right, particularly lead, because a lead can cause some uh, cinematic condition uh, that mimic uh, ASD behavior, right? And then the last three, um, uh, uh, some team believe that is necessary and some don't. And those are the language assessment, uh, sensory evaluation, and then uh, whether or not a neurological or a genetic assessment to raw biological issue. Pretty much if you've done the, the first six, um, most very good a regional center or 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 evaluation team uh, can uh, come to a conclusion of of the uh, diagnosis uh, of ASD or not. Okay, next slide, please. Now under the uh, the Medi-Cal eligibility requirement, um, all the following coverage criteria must be met in order for your child to receive BHC services. Number one. Of course, it has to be under the age of 21. And, and, and I do have questions about adults with ASD, unfortunately, currently uh, in California, uh, Medicaid services for BHTs only fall under the EPSDT and therefore uh, is only be uh, eligible for individual under the age of 21. Um, the child must have a diagnosis of ASD, must have a recommendation that uh, BHC services are medically necessary, and, and we talked about that earlier. Uh, your child must be medically stable, and your child must be without a need for 24-hour medical nursing monitoring or procedure provided in a hospital or intermediate care facility for persons with intellectual disability. So your child has to be not in those facility. Okay, so your child must meet all five criteria in order to be eligible for BAT services. All right, next slide, please. Um, so the Medi-Cal uh, cover BAT uh, services must be medical necessary, as we talked about earlier. Uh, it really have to be delivered in according to the health plan's approval. So the health plan has to approve the uh, the, the, the the recommendation. Uh, and then the health plan have to approve the behavioral health treatment uh, that are developed and supervised by a contract entity that are credentialed by the health plan as qualified autism service provider. And qualified autism service provider um, could be a board certified behavior analyst, a licensed psychologist, licensed marriage family therapist, a licensed educational psychologist, a uh, licensed clinical social worker, or a licensed professional clinical counselor. Um, next slide, please. So what are the medical necessity criteria? And there is an all plan letter that was issued to the health plan, um, a number of 14011, um, 14 here means uh, in 2014, um, that the following services do not meet medical necessity criteria or qualify for Medi-Cal cover BAT services for reimbursement. And those are their therapy services render when continued clinical benefit is not expected. And then we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Uh, services that are primarily respite, daycare, or educational in nature and are used to reimburse a parent for participating in the treatment program, those would not qualify. And then custodial care. Uh, such as 
uh, uh, care that assists in daily living, like bathing, uh, dressing, eating, maintaining personal hygiene and safety. Those are not care uh, that are included uh, in the uh, set of benefits. All right. And here is the, the, the buzzword. It's the second bullet point when they talk about services that are primarily educational in nature. And that's why the, 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 the school district, the school would have to work very closely with the health plan in deciding whether or not uh, the, the, the intervention is based on the educational need or based on anything else, because uh, the schools also responsible for some ABA services as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, this is how it works. So let's say if your child got a comprehensive uh, uh, diagnostic evaluation and determined to have ASD, and uh, the team recommend um, BHT services, right? Then you will call the health plan. The next step would be um, the health plan have to get a qualified autism service provider to perform a functional behavior assessment. So what this assessment does is this assessment will determine what are the intervention that will be appropriate for your child and what are the goals uh, within the next six months uh, to be achieved um, by the children by the intervention, right? So when you, when you have the diagnosis by the CDE and you have the recommendation for BHT and you call the health plan and you request the next step, which is the functional behavior assessment, the health plan have 15 days to get that ready going for you, meaning the, the, the health plan have to give you um, uh, the, the, the appointment for the functional behavior assessment within 15 days. So whoever the qualified autism uh, service provider uh, will work with you, with the family, and, and make an appointment for an, uh, a functional behavior assessment. And sometimes it could fall out of the 15 days because it's based on your schedule and your availability to get the child in for this full functional assessment. So once the assessment is done, the provider is supposed to write up a report and the provider will tell you, hey, I have submitted the report uh, to the health plan, and the report will basically make a set of recommendations of what kind of interventions and what kind of outcome uh, should be expected from the intervention. Once that report landed on the desk of the health plan, the health plan has 15 days to ensure that the child will start the service. I want to make that very clear, and those are regulated by the state, okay? And then, uh, so it means that the health plan will be the one to authorize services um, uh, that are recommended by the functional behavior assessment, right? And the, all, the, the health plan is only able to authorize those services uh, do not exceed six months. So it means that every six months, there has to be an evaluation process the qualified autism uh, service provider must submit a report um, as, and, and, and clearly lay out what the next six months goal would be and what intervention would be. So it would be to the parent's benefit to when you get to month five to really push the qualified autism service provider to get ready to submit the report on month six. So then it will be on time uh, arriving at the desk of the health plan, so then they can authorize for the next set of treatment, so there's no no break in between, right? So it's very, very important, even though the health plan is supposed to remind the provider to do this, but, you know, um, sometimes people get busy. A multiple reminder is better than just one or two. So um, uh, I, I, would, I would encourage parents to do that. Um, the BHT services shall be rendered in accordance with the beneficiary's treatment plan, right? So it has to be person-centered. The parents have to participate in it because remember the, the, the evidence base is that um, the, the provider, the intervention, whoever the person do the intervention is not with you 24 seven. It is the caretaker that with the child 24 seven. So whatever that the, the intervention is being implemented uh, by the provider, the parents need to learn to do that as well. And, and you, you have to use that set of intervention outside of the, the treatment hours, right? Because when you spend quality time with your child or you're out in the, in the real world environment or in your social environment, 
you need to be able to continue with the intervention because repeated intervention from both the provider and the, and the parents will give your child a better chance in changing their behavior. So that's why uh, it's required that the parents uh, need to be participating in that intervention, um, all right? Next slide, please. And there, are the, the APL also have really specific guidelines is that uh, the provider have to identify long, intermediate, and short-term goals and objectives that are very specific, right? Behaviorally defined, measurable, and based upon clinical observation. Uh, it would include outcome measurement assessment criteria that will be used to measure achievement of behavior objectives. They have to use evidence-based treatment. They have to include care and coordination. The health plan has to include care coordination involving parents and caretaker and the school. And I would add here the primary care physician is also very important as well. Um, and then clearly define the service type. Uh, so the next slide will talk about what are the established ABA intervention for the individual under the age of 22. Uh, these are based on the National Standard Project, which went through all of the uh, intervention that are currently uh, attempt to help individuals with ASD, and, and, and here are the list of interventions that they blessed, meaning they said um, uh, these are the interventions that have the most evidence in helping children with ASD, and the state, most state, if not all, uh, have used this as a, uh, a benchmark in, uh, in, in um, advising a health plan that if a provider use this kind of intervention, then um, uh, it is uh, covered under the benefit, all right? And there's other intervention, if you heard about and it's not listed here, most likely the state would not cover for the treatment on those interventions, okay? Next slide, please. So when does a family always ask, well, how long can my child have the BHT services? Well, of course, number one answer is until your child hit 21, right? Or otherwise, if the BHT services, the treatment goals are achieved, then the BHT services may be discontinued uh, or when the goals are not met, right? So if you have a set up goal for six months, the child didn't meet the goal, they have to modify the goal. If, again, the child didn't meet the goal, then a health plan has the right to terminate the BHT services. All BHT is no longer medically necessary, right? So the, together the health plan and the provider will determine the medical necessity. So those are when BHT services can be discontinued by the health plan. Next slide, this is the check-in point. Let's see if we have any questions so far. Hi, uh, yes, we do have some questions now. And uh, the first question, um, says that you mentioned that the county should be doing a full assessment to see if a child meets the criteria um, and what does that assessment consist of? Okay, so that assessment, uh, um, a good full assessment would involve a face-to-face -face meeting with the child and the family and go through what we call a, a, a psychiatric structure interview, right? Asking about past uh, history, uh, of, of the family as it related to mental health, physical health, uh, understanding the child developmental stages and what the issue that's facing the family currently and assess the family and the social situation uh, and some testing that is appropriate depends on, on, on the, uh, the condition. So let's say if a child is depressed, then there are some screening tools that they, have, they can use uh, to screen the level of depression, et cetera. Right, um, and it's also uh, involved gathering information from the school, see how the child's performing well in school, educational wise, relatedness to their uh, to their classmates, etc. That is a full assessment. It's not just over the phone five minutes. Say, oh yeah, your child have this and that. Oh, by the way, the child's not qualified. That's not a full assessment. A full assessment includes including detailed history taking, observing the child talk to the child and talk to the caregiver in person. Thank you. Um, and the next question, I think this person may want a little bit of clarification. Um, they write, the Department of Healthcare Services requires the health plan company to provide the CDE and not the regional centers un under the state mandates. 
Right. So that's what I mean is depends on the health plan that you work with, the previous health plan that I work with, we have an understanding with the local seven regional center uh, who wanted to provide the CDE uh, because uh, they also want to ensure that children under their catchment not only qualify for Medi-Cal cover benefit, but also for services that Medi-Cal does not cover and they have. And they made it available, so they want to know who's the kid in my catchment area that have the need for these services. And that's why LA Care Health Plan specifically and several other health plans work with the regional center for that piece. The health plan can also contract with um, other entities that do a full comprehensive uh, uh, diagnostic evaluation. Uh, and, and we had that at LA Care. I believe that LA Care also contract with a couple other entities that do that. I know in Inland Empire Health Plan, uh, they have an entity uh, that have uh, that based out of Loma Linda University that do also do a comprehensive diagnostic evaluation. It, it depends. I mean, LA County, like I said, has a third of all the regional center, so it could afford us to do that. Uh, to have that kind of relationship with regional centers, but other health plans from other county might not be able to do so. Uh, so it is the responsibility of the health plan to find an entity, a contract with an entity that can perform the comprehensive diagnostic evaluation. Good question for clarification. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question, uh, when did the DSM-5 come into place? So the DSM-5 comes into place a few years now, and you heard my voice uh, kind of go in and out. <laughs> I went to grab my DSM-5 and actually it was uh, available since 2012 to now, uh, technically 2013, so it was available since then. All right. And for family who interested in, 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 in wanting uh, to read it, I don't know why you want to read it, but um, most bookstores like Barnes & Noble have it. You can go in there and, 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 and Brown through the section in mental health, and the, the DSM-5 is available on the bookshelf. It's the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorder. Right? Great. So uh, let us move on, if you don't mind, Sarah, because we only have about uh, 18 minutes or so. I want to make sure I cover the next section, and then we can open up for general Q&A. Is that okay? Absolutely. So next slide, please. So. Um, this slide um, is part of a presentation that I just, a uh, webinar that I just did a couple months ago. And really, it speaks to the complications of most of our children or individuals living with mental illness uh, uh, facing. And, and, and some of it is gene genetics, and some of it is, is medication induced, and some of it is because of the association of different health conditions, right? So usually an individual living with mental illness or a child living with severe emotional disturbances would have other conditions as well, like uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, obesity, asthma, epilepsy, et cetera. And when we talk about obesity and diabetes, particularly when a child is on antipsychotic medication for their mood disorder or for their uh, psychosis. Uh, they are uh, exposed to and have risk uh, for developing diabetes and, 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 and weight gain. And there are some study now also talk about the association between different health conditions um, with mental health conditions. So we know that mental illness is associated with lower utilization of medical care, reduced adherence to medication for chronic diseases, and increased risk of adverse health outcomes. So I think it's very important that when you talk about treatment for mental health, excuse me, for ASD, for uh, uh, children with ASD or children with severe uh, emotional disturbances that you really have to have a comprehensive treatment approach. Uh, even children with ASD, just because you have ASD, it doesn't mean that the child, your child, is not prone to anxiety disorder or depression, etc. So, uh, really, the the the, the ASD provider also have to work very closely with the mental health provider should your child have what we call co-occurring condition, right? Meaning ASD and another mental health condition. So that's why I wanna introduce the family focus uh, uh, model of care. If you go to the next slide, Sarah, please. This uh, next slide, the infinity diagram, if you look at the top 
right corner, uh, if you talk about mental health uh, treatment or behavioral health treatment available in our community right now, the top uh, right uh, upper corner on the Right, upper corner, the top uh, upper corner, right, upper, um, the top upper corner. I say that wrong. I apologize. The 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 the, the top corner on the right hand side are uh, acute uh, behavioral health care uh, services, which include uh, inpatient services, chemical dependency services, uh, children hospital for physical health, and what have you. The bottom would be. Uh, recovery and rehab center, right? So intensive outpatient, a partial hospitalization, residential treatment program, transitional living center. So those are more on the acute and the recovery side. Now on the community side, on the left hand side, your child involves some child and 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 particularly children in the foster care system involve multiple places, right? You have your pediatrician in the primary care setting alone, or some of them would have a family fo of, of focus, which I propose, uh, outpatient clinics. Um, you might brush with the social services agency, uh, law enforcement. You've got the family, home. you got school, vocational rehab. You have the neighborhood that your child uh, uh, is living in. Uh, you have churches and clergymen. You have the regional center, and you have com other community organizations and family resource centers. So a child that touches multiple points might have multiple case manager or case coordinator, as you will. And many of them have different information for you. And I found that when family with children that involve with multiple uh, uh, entity, human and health services, it causes a huge confusion for the family. And so care is so silo. Uh, you, you come here for mental health services, you go there for a, a behavioral health treatment services, BBA services, and then yet you have to go to your primary care physician, and then you have to go to specialists if your child has other health conditions. So it, 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 it really wastes family a lot of time in traveling around. and and on top of that, getting all of them to talk to each other is a real chore. And I, I, I don't have to uh, say much about it because I'm sure you experience it if your child has multiple condition is that very rarely uh, are they, are they um, able, I'm not going to say willing, are they able to, to talk to each other about your child uh, to be able to come up with a one treatment plan on how do we approach this child as a whole person and provide that care. And so what, what we propose is a family-focused outpatient clinic where it's a one-stop shop and care for the, the family and the child, right? Because you might have multiple children and you might have parents with depression as well. So if, if, if the child and, and the other adults in the family see different set of mental health providers, do they talk to each other? Do they have any idea of what's going on with the family dynamic? So we propose a family-focused um, integrated care model. If you go to the next slide, what this model speaks to is a model that would provide care for the whole family, inclusive of mental health, substance use disorder, and primary care, right? So all those services are integrated into one, one entity, one setting. Uh, and 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 that care model also responsible to coordinate and link the family, the child to the community resources program, and and you have the same care team that provided uh, at the different level of recovery, right? So right now, if you have Medi-Cal and if you meet specialty mental health services, you go to the county. When you no longer meet the specialty mental health services, then you have to go to the health plan mental health provider. So you have to get to know the new set, a new set of mental health provider. And to me, it doesn't make sense anymore. It should be one, it really doesn't make any sense at all. And specifically when you talk about a child with a complicated issue, right? Or a family with, with, with multiple family member with need, um, uh, because you deal with multiple case manager. In this model, there's only one care team, one care manager, who will be able to help the family to link with all other services um, in terms of uh, uh, human services. 
and 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 all other specialty health services. And yet this model speaks to the integrations of mental health, substance use disorder, and primary care altogether. Uh, this is the beginning. I understand that SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, a few years back has piloted uh, a few places in the country for this model, and 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 they had great outcomes. But unfortunately, the funding stopped, and we couldn't uh, find way to fund this kind of, of of care model because funding is separate, right? Funding for mental health separate from substance use disorder, and yet separate from primary care uh, 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 treatment. Uh, when it comes to Medicaid services. So um, I thought this is a great v uh, uh, venue to introduce and advocate for a, uh, a new care model that take the person into consideration as a whole person and take the family into uh, consideration as a whole ecosystem that the provider must pay attention to. So with that, I'm gonna stop and, and leave the remaining 10 minutes for questions and answers. Great, thank you. Um, I'll follow up uh, where we left off previously. Uh, the next question, uh, a child was evaluated for autism disorder in 2011 and results were many borderline red flags but no diagnosis with recommendation to as assess in two to three years. With the okay. DSM-5, does this evaluation look different from 2011 to today? Uh, no, I mean the the, the same set of of, uh, of 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 tool be used in evaluating, but whatever the diagnosis that they are uh, given the child in 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 2011, it is all now lumped under ASD. So therefore, I'll give an example: if the child was diagnosed as having Asperger syndrome, for example, before the DSM-5, Asperger syndrome was not something that you would give ABA services to because ABA services to speak to specifically to autistic spectrum dis autism disorder, right? So now all the other conditions lumped under ASD, therefore your child now would benefit, would would qualify for it. Um, it it's more of a qualification than whether or not the, uh, versus whether or not the, the intervention is effective. I hope I, I answered that clear. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and if there are no EBA facilitators available or they're full in your area, what can a family do to receive services? So I think that um, that's where you need to negotiate with the health plan because the health plan under the state regulation have to make sure that there are enough provider uh, to fulfill the need uh, because the, the, the health plan responsible to implement the benefit. So the family need to talk with the health plan and 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 uh, really if there are provider out of the network or out of the area that is convenient for the family and the health plan does not have any available provider within the network or within the area, the health plan would be responsible to ensure that the child uh, uh, get that care, right? Uh, and I say out of area, meaning out of county, not necessarily out of state, uh, that's different. Great, um, and is there a difference of services and coverage with um, Medi-Cal waiver, or Medi-Cal Medi medical waiver? So. No, it doesn't matter whether or not your child's in a, a different waiver, as long as your child has ASD, your child is covered under EPSDT. Okay. Um, one more question just came in, uh, one second. Um, I have encountered that if a child has a diagnosis of ASD and is an Alta client um, or BMH, have been turning away kids. So remember, under the uh, specialty mental health uh, criteria, um, uh, which we didn't talk about because the specialty, oh, well, yes, I did. It, 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 on, on one of the slides that you must have a covered diagnosis. Uh, unfortunately, ASD alone is an exclusive diagnosis and a diagnosis of exclusion for specialty mental health services. So let me repeat that. Under the regulation currently, um, ASD is not a covered uh, diagnosis under specialty mental health services. But if your child has ASD and clearly distinctive anxiety disorder, severe anxiety disorder, or severe depression, your child will qualify for specialty mental health services. 
if the condition is severe enough. And the county, especially mental health services, will treat your child and be responsible for treating your child anxiety disorder and or uh, the severe uh, depression, uh, but not the ASD. So the, the ABA services, the BHC services is not the responsibility of the county. I hope that makes that very clear. And that's why most county are required to do a full assessment because the, the, most, most of the time parents would call the county and say, hey, I have my, my child and I think my child needs treatment because of anxiety or whatever it is. And by the way, my child also has autistic spectrum disorder, tendency for new staff to not understand and once they hear, oh, uh, 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 ASD, that's the regional responsibility, therefore your child don't qualify. That's not true. I mean, if your child has other mental health conditions, then the county is obligated to do a full assessment for the other condition. Thank you. Um, and the next question, um, is there a list of where patients who have DX, DX can receive ASD services? In San Francisco for medical patients, it, it's only SFHP. That I don't know, but you can you can send me an email because I do have friends in San Francisco and, and I will find out for you, whoever posed that question. Thank you. Uh, as of now, that is all the questions that have come through. And I'd like to thank you, Dr. Chow, for um, today's presentation and remind everyone after the webinar is over to please go ahead and take the short survey that comes through in your inbox to give us some feedback about the presentation. And as mentioned earlier, if you have any personal questions about your child or anything that didn't get addressed today, feel free to send that um, either to us or to Dr. Chow, and we'll make sure um, that gets answered for you. Hey, thank you, Sarah, thank and you thank so you, much. everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.